Cool. Um, so uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, a little bit about Relativity to begin with. Uh, Relativity is a growing global tech company. We're headquartered in Chicago right now. Um, and we basically make software that ena enables our clients to manage and um, analyze very large amounts of unstructured data. So stuff like a Word document or an image where you don't really have a structured schema around it like you would see in a database. Um, we also have headquarters in Krakow, Poland, and then scattered around the world in a few other locations. Um, and we've been growing pretty explosively in the last five years or so from a few hundred uh, employees to over a thousand now. Uh, the vast, ma not vast majority, a very large majority of which are engineers. Um, oh no, this is not what I wanted. No, sorry. I don't know why these didn't present. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software engineer working on our platform team. So that basically means that I'm developing the framework on which the rest of Relativity is built. Um, I work very closely with our other in-house engineers and then relatively closely with third-party engineers at other companies who utilize Relativity to build their own applications on top of. Then Neha, if you would like to introduce yourself. Yes, sure. Hi, I'm Neha. Um, I am a software engineer at Relativity in a very different domain. Um, I work in a performance engineering team um, and we make sure uh, the software that's getting in the hands of customers is vetted out to, for uh, solid performance uh, quality, meaning the software not only works as expected, but it also is performant, it scales up, to meet the market needs. And it also is efficient and mindful um, in using the resources um, in terms of our um, infrastructure that we throw at it. So we are mindful of not creating that hardware waste just by making software more smart that way. So that's a little about me. Okay, so diving right into some tips for preparation. Um, just FYI, I probably should have put like a table of contents slide on this. Um, it's kind of an informal presentation, I guess. Uh, but we're going to be going over basically your prep for your interview, um, the technical video interview, a technical in person, though they're not really in person this year, uh, interview, and then just kind of like some other tips that we he thought of while while coming up with this presentation. So to start with, tips for interview preparation. Mia, this is your slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. I think it's it's a good handoff you're doing here. Um, so start off with uh, tips for the prep because you're doing all of this stuff and being mindful of this stuff before you even enter the actual uh, interview mode. The first and foremost thing I feel is super important is making sure our resume and the LinkedIn profile are up to date. And I highly recommend going back to this every quarter and making sure the most recent um, and the accomplishments you're most proud of are always showing up there. Because especially uh, in cases like mine and so many other folks on the same team, we were reached out to by recruiters. Uh, and so those opportunities came to us at a time we weren't even expecting, but we were so glad and gladly surprised by it. So I think having the most information out there about yourself uh, at all times is going to be really helpful there. Uh, the next two things are that come with, um, okay, so a recruiter reached out to me or I found some opportunity in the market and I feel I could go grab it, but do I really want to work in this company? And that's a question you can answer with the next two points is know all about that company, their culture, their people, their key business, their key service offerings or product offerings. Um, read their glass reviews from folks uh, in there, have been there to kind of get a good idea on what kind of organization this is that you are shooting for. And so that gets you either excited that, yes, I want to be there or make a conscious decision of not for me, but either case, it's a good piece of information to have. Um, the next thing is you want to have a good, solid, crisp, short introduction ready before you start talking to anybody. And that would start from your recruiter goes into uh, the team, the, the hiring manager you talk to, or the other partner teams you talk to. With every new person that you're talking, the first thing you ever do is introduce yourself. So I highly recommend have this two minute elevator pitch ready 
um, that gives a little bit about uh, what your um, academic um, volunteer, even professional experience has been so far, and what is something that you're most passionate about. Um, after that comes the actual prep for interviewing process, which is my favorite thing, whiteboarding. Um, scribbling or whiteboarding through an interview is really great because what happens is it lets you structure your thoughts as you're going through. So you can have a rough draft of your thoughts in, uh, draw it out in terms of um, whether it's a system architecture diagram that you are going to talk to different pieces about or it's just a problem that you've outlined and that you're going to go into details later, but at least structure your thoughts with that. The other benefit is it gives the interviewer a peek into your thought process on how you're going about solving the problem. Because always it's not important to come to a, an ideal working solution and it's sometimes not even possible. Maybe the problems are too complicated at the time. Maybe that's not even the expectation of the interviewer with you today. But if they can see how you go about uh, breaking down the problem into smaller modules and attack one at a time, um, they can see that you can be successful in your professional experience using that skill. So that's exactly uh, what um, interviewers look for when you go into whiteboarding exercises. The other thing is what we kind of covered already, communication skills. Are you able to communicate the ideas in your head um, to the interviewer uh, so they see uh, your point of view of why you took a certain route of solving a problem versus the others. Um, and if you can do that effectively, then the battle is half won right there. After that, there have been cases people have uh, aced interviews even with a couple of wrong answers. Uh, and that's, that's totally something that happens. So uh, whiteboard, 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 can't stress it enough. Uh, I think Hannah, you have some more tips to add on to these, so I'll take it over. Yeah, we, we, we pretty much have whiteboard tips throughout the whole presentation because it's kind of like the bread and butter of technical interviews. So if you can do a good whiteboard interview, like you're golden. Um, so that's kind of a lead in for uh, the next slide. So talking about some specific technical stuff that you can uh, try to brush up on uh, in prep for interviews. So first things first, you want to figure out what language you're going to be coding in. Usually for interviews, most technical interviews, especially if it's something like a whiteboard interview or just a notepad interview where you're like sharing your screen and writing stuff down in a notepad. Um, usually the language that you use is pretty flexible. It's mostly whatever you feel comfortable with. I highly recommend reaching out to the recruiter that contacted you from the company and making sure that you know like wh generally what languages their interviewers will be most comfortable in. For instance, uh, at Relativity, we're very much a .NET shop, so I'm most comfortable with C Sharp. Java, I'm also pretty comfortable with. It's very similar to C Sharp, um, but so you wouldn't want to come in expecting to write pure C or, you know, Scala or something in order to, to solve the interview. You, you want to use a language that's going to be able to be talked about intelligently by both you and the interviewer, but you do want to make sure you're comfortable in it. Um, you also just like need to know the basics. You need to know how to write a class structure from defining the class to methods to properties, know how to do a constructor, um, know how to make every sort of basic uh, primitive type like strings and ints. Um, these are things that like you're going to need to be able to do from scratch for whatever your chosen language is. And uh, you know, you're eventually going to learn it just through having done it enough times. So you might as well start now. Um, another big thing with technical interviews is you want to know the time complexity and memory complexity of a method. Um, I don't think I've ever not been in an, a technical interview that has not asked me for the big O notation of either an example piece of code or a piece of code that I wrote during the interview. Um, it can also actually help you a lot if you're having trouble reaching the most optimum solution for uh, the problem. You can actually use the big O notation to drill into, oh, this is the area that's not optimal. How can I fix this? This is where the most time is being spent or the most memory is going. How can I fix that? Um, so knowing how to utilize the big O notation is also very good. Um, and then just know your basic data stru structures and algorithms, as well as their time and memory complexity. 
Um, so like I just list out uh, some examples of data structures and algorithms that I consider basic and need to know for, um, for technical interviewing. And the reason I say know the time and memory complexity of these is that if you use um, something really far, some data structure that's really far out there and you don't know what its time or memory complexi complexity is and then the interviewer, interviewer asks you, so what's the time complexity of your method, you're, you're going to be in a bit of a, a sticky situation. It's not going to be very fun to explain, oh, I, I don't know. Um, so just make sure that anything that you're going to be using during the interview, you know at least basically what the complexity of it is. And then uh, passing this back over to Neha. Mm -hmm. I do want to add on to the last point, because it's super important, is um, there are uh, positions even in the technical realm that uh, for teams that don't directly write software for that's the bread and butter for the company, but you do have to analyze uh, how that code is written to be able to eke out better performance out of it, to be able to make it better for quality, functional or uh, otherwise. And in that sense, understanding at algorithmic level, what that piece of code is trying to do, what are some of the big no-nos in terms of writing efficient software? For example, when I have to look for performance problems, the first thing I look out for is uh, for loops. If you're looping across, you're making database calls to fetch some data back and then waiting on your front end to load this data up to show it to the customer. But what you did in the back end was tied up in a loop. Then what the customer sees is the pages clocking endlessly. And what you don't doesn't see is you're just churning out the wheels in the back end, trying to grab so many smaller pieces of data to just give that impact to the customer. Hey, I got your request working on it. Here's your first slice. So those kind of um, tweaks in software are also very interesting. Uh, and they, at least for positions like mine, uh, interview when it came to coding was not about uh, was not entirely about write software, but it was also about can you analyze the hotspots in your software uh, to give us an idea of where you would attack first, where is the most value for your bug uh, when you have to go down tweaking it. So I think uh, at least at algorithmic level, that's where I would recommend everybody to start and then jump right into coding from there. Uh, which brings me to the next one. Um, now say we have gone through the initial round of phone screening. We know a little about each other. The recruiter knows about us. We know about our company. We're both excited to kind of take this further. Um, the first round that you talk to the hiring manager who has really opened up this role, so he pretty much knows most about the role, is uh, brings a lot of questions with you to the interview to say, um, I feel the requirement asks for these things, but beyond what I see here on the job recs, can you tell me about some of the challenges that you guys are already facing and how can I pitch in? And so you kind of get an idea of what are uh, some of the ideas of this team, where they want to go from here, what is the direction they're taking, what are their roadblocks, and do you feel uh, challenged but excited to fill those gaps for them? That's amazing. That can happen in the beginning. I usually do it in the end, but I've, I've heard so many of my friends who start their interview with that as well, and they say, you know, they throw in ideas of like, hey, you know what, I can be helpful in, in, in experience A, B, and C. So take it as you want. Uh, I prefer doing it in the end. But the most important thing there is uh, be inquisitive, uh, listen carefully, because sometimes those questions come with some of those cues. You can read into them if you're, if you're listening intently. So um, come, come with questions prepared, but also think of them as you go take notes, uh, uh, have follow-up questions for the interviewer, hit them back with them. They'd really appreciate that because it really puts a good impression that you're um, deeply interested in the problems that they are trying to solve. Um, then I want to touch up on um, phone etiquette, uh, really important. So because these interviews have gone so much more uh, remote than they used to before, you're really not getting an in-person time in the future. So make sure the phone call is, is even more prepped up with you seeming confident, you seeming prepared, um, and you seeming humble to take back feedback and work with it. That give and take is really powerful in interviews. Uh, step into a quiet place for taking the interview call. Interruptions are the number one uh, thing that kind of puts off the interviewer because 
it gives them impression this is not important enough, which is not true. So, so let's not give them that impression. Um, be short, concise, uh, to the point in the beginning. Give the interviewer a little overview and make sure they do want to get into the weeds of this. If yes, sure, go ahead. But if not, um, let's not take up all the time in a few answers. Give the interviewer some time back so they can come back with good follow-ups for you. Uh, that is a better give and take when you can have a healthy mix of, of both kinds of introductions going. Uh, be resourceful, very interesting uh, point because Interviews at any stage of our careers are never going to be a know-it-all scenario. We're always on a learning path. There's always going to be curveballs that we don't know about. But what is highly recommended in, in case of complex problems is look at them as, can I break this down into smaller, simpler problems that I can attack first? And then I can look back at the end-to-end -end picture later. I don't have to be overwhelmed by the entire big picture right now and not being able to perform even at 10%. So I'd rather give them my small 25, 30% and keep building on top of that. Um, and what if some portion of my responses are better than the others? And then I can kind of take the interview in that direction too. So show your strong points. Uh, and that's what I meant by being resourceful is use everything you have. If you're more comfortable drawing it out, you're more comfortable drawing on a whiteboard, you're more comfortable writing it down in, and presenting it to them. Whatever it is that works for you, go for it. Basically, two things matter. Can you show them the approach of how you tackle complex problems where you don't know everything? And two, can you communicate that effectively? If you've got these two, you're good. Um, the, the next point, I don't want to talk about it again, but it is really important to take with you is know that we'll not know everything at all points. Know that even the interviewer would not know some of the answers that they're coming with you today. It's the exchange of ideas that they're coming in for. Sometimes it's just a, a new opinion, a fresh opinion from somebody new that this team has not heard of before. So you never know. Uh, so go in with that confidence that we all are still learning, uh, but we are all trying to present the best version of ourselves and the true version of ourselves in that interview. I think that's, that's my key takeaway from the video interview process. Um, Hannah, you wanted to add something on top of that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say um, uh, for the phone interview, um, if it is a technical phone interview uh, and you're doing live coding with your interviewer, make sure you ask before you use outside resources. Um, this is something that I, I hadn't thought about when we were putting this presentation together, but it is something I have seen in the past during technical interviews. Um, some places are fine with using Google and outside resources and reference pages, stuff like that. Some places are not. So before you use anything like that, ask the interviewer. It's considered relatively rude to just use it and not ask. Um, but asking is always okay. Okay. And then moving on to the coding challenge. Miha, this is also yours, I believe. Yes, um, I'll scoot through this fast in the interest of time. But what we have seen um, in relative experience was you get five or six coding challenges in a matter of two hours. And this time is sufficient. You can time yourself at half an hour per problem uh, on the complex ones. And that there would be a couple simple ones thrown in there. So. Uh, don't be afraid of the time in, in case of these challenges. Uh, be very honest with these approaches. Make sure you remember what you're doing today, why you're thinking of a particular approach and you like it better than the others, because there's a good chance when you go into the next round of in-person or now video uh, conferences or uh, interviews, that you may be cross-questioned on, uh, or rather verified on why you think this approach is better than the other. So have your ideas uh, documented somewhere. Um, and be able to be ready to talk about them at the next time. Um, start simple uh, and then proceed towards more complex problems. Um, if you are stuck with some big, uh, some complicated problem, come back at it later or attempt a portion of it that you think you're, you're good at, um, but then kind of try to uh, write an algorithm around it, write your uh, ideas around it, like even documenting the pointers is also okay. And there are a lot of tools in the market. This is just a Google search that I did saying coding challenges and some of these logos came up, but there are so many others that we can uh, play around with. Uh, these are uh, exercises that we can do to make sure our code compiles, our code um, runs with a ton of use cases 
and um, we have an idea of writing methods on the fly. Like that's the habit you want to build in. So that's that's all about the coding challenge. I want to say. And this is the last round, which is you're meeting a ton of people on uh, one day. So these are back to back uh, on all different themes of, of uh, professional uh, experience that they want to see you can bring on. First and most important, at least uh, relativity is core values. It's not about you blending into the existing culture of the company, but it is what you bring to add on to that culture to make it richer. So um, uh, be uh, uh, be open about um, your ideas because I think this round is what is about um, your uniqueness, but still you being able to work so well with the rest of the company. Um, and this is a short session, about 30 minutes. The next session you go into is more about um, insight or in the market, it's called top grade, which is we want to kind of look at your career graph or even your academics, volunteers, um, any kind of experience so far where you have organized uh, things you've gone about delivering uh, value to your uh, organization, how you went about do that, what were your high points, what were your low points, why do you want to work here, why do you want to work here comes from your research that you've done about the company. And so you know uh, what values of this company do you identify with uh, yourself. So those kind of things are really rich exchange that kind of uh, enforce confidence on both parties of, of uh, they want to work with each other in the future. And the last is a technical round, which is it could be a continuation of the coding challenge that you've done before, which could be uh, talking more about it, drawing more about the approaches you've probably taken, or it could be a brand new problem. In my case, it was drawing architecture that you worked with. How did you test the different pieces of, of different components of this entire end-to-end um, -end workflow? And then how did you tie in all the pieces in a more integrated format and test that instead? So there was a ton of things that were going on there. But I think just drawing it on the board and then talking through different pieces made it so much easier. Um, so it could be any of that. So the general approach is when you try to answer questions on a technical interview, round one or round end is, is the same. You highlight the problem statement. What is the problem that you are trying to solve? Second, you go about uh, how you went about solving the problem. Third, what was the solution and how it impacted the larger good, the organization, your end customers, whatever that is. So I think if you've got these the structured answers, every answer you frame in technical rounds in this kind of structure, it really helps the developers, uh, the interviewer see the value you brought in uh, the efforts you've taken so far. So that's that's my two cents on this. Okay, and then um, to dig in a bit more deeply into that, like in person or last round technical interview, where you're like usually you would be whiteboarding with um, some developers uh, that that would be just kind of evaluating your code, evaluating how you're thinking about things. Um, so here's just kind of like some tips to approach these interviews once you get into them. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, questions are never a bad thing. In fact, I usually consider it a bit of a bad sign if a uh, a candidate asks no questions at all, because I'm not sure if they are actually understanding what the prompt is, or if they're nervous and they're scared to speak up. Um, it's, it's, it's usually not a great sign if no questions are asked. But equally, don't ask like every question. Some things you don't really need to know, uh, technically, like to complete the solution. Um, and you really want to spend the majority of your time writing down your solution and explaining what you're writing down. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions, but keep them essential. Um, make assumptions when you want to. I don't care how you spell that method name and I don't care what the signature is on it. All I care about is how are you using it? Um, so if you're making assumptions about I have this merge sort method and these are the parameters it takes in and this is what it gives me back. It doesn't have to be 100% correct to the language you're using. It just needs to make sense and it needs to be communicated to the interviewer. I've never had an interviewer after I've made an assumption say, no, you can't do that without then redirecting me to a better path. Um, and then when in doubt, 
which will happen quite often because I assure you, you'll get into these in-person interviews and you'll think you'll be completely fine and then you will just get such stage fright. It helps to just start with the basics. Just brute force it, go as simple as possible if you're not sure what to do. And once you have that basic approach and it basically works, that's when you start playing with it. Again, with that, that's something I recommend telling the interviewer that you're doing, like I'm not sure how to do the optimal solution, but let's start with a brute force approach and then work from there. That's the thing we'd like to really see. Um, your whiteboard code, uh, again, whiteboarding, uh, it needs to be understandable, but because you're writing it down, um, it doesn't need to compile. I, I don't care about the semicolons. I don't care about the curly braces. Um, it doesn't need to be compilable but it does have to be understandable to the interviewer and to yourself. So just keep that in mind as you're writing. Sometimes uh, people go a bit overboard trying to make things syntactically correct and it actually trips them up. Um, but also don't go too simple where it, you're, you're, you're make, taking a lot of shortcuts and a lot of pseudocode. Um, and then as far as not knowing things, like Nia said, sometimes you're gonna not know things. That's normal and like, even my tech lead uh, will defer to other people quite often because you just can't know everything. Uh, and it's okay to tell the interviewer, I, I don't know the answer to that question. You should always, always, always follow up, I don't know, with a short explanation of how you would plan to figure that out in a real project. For instance, if you used a sorting method and I said, what's the time complexity on that? And you said, you didn't know, you could say, I don't know, but I could always Google that or check a reference sheet for that, you know, if this were a real world project. And then moving on to just kind of like some bonus round of stuff. Um, these are just some three uh, skill sets that I think are big differentiators between somebody who is good and somebody who is a great candidate. Um, so automated testing, knowing the difference between an integration test, a unit test, and like all the levels in between of those tests, that's very impressive. Even if you only know it in theory and you don't know how to implement it, knowing how to implement basic unit testing, I think also really makes candidates uh, stand out. Um, internally at Relativity, we use N units, so that's what I recommend people try because that's what I started with. Um, but really any testing framework would be fine to, to demonstrate the, these skills. And then SQL and relational databases especially, but this kind of applies to NoSQL as well. Um, SQL is actually how I got my job at Relativity. I bombed my interview. I did terribly. It was a system design interview and I, I, I hadn't done any system design at that point. So I bombed it. But there were also SQL questions and those I did very, very good on. So, you know, definitely keep these things, these, uh, the like peripheral technical skills in mind because they are differentiators. Um, knowing at least the basics of SQL is very important, but knowing advanced operations like joins, grouping, uh, common table expressions, those things are really stand out. Um, and then software design patterns. If you can demonstrate one of these while you're still solving the problem asked by the interviewer, that looks really great. Um, also just knowing these will really improve your code quality and I would highly recommend you guys like looking up some design patterns. Um, Niha, did you want to say anything else about those two slides before I think we move into Q&A? Not at all, I agree 100% um, with these uh, differentiator skills. 